Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of the seminar series is, as always, to bring the community together. Our seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 11 Eastern or 10 a.m. Central, all available on the YouTube channel. If you've missed any of our presentations so far, I encourage you to check the YouTube channel out where you can watch all of the prior seminars. We also have a great group of speakers planned for the upcoming months, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks <clears throat> to a few people. First, Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and two CMCC students who help with the seminar series, Quintarius Moore and Kat Katie Floyd. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do continue to uh, follow us on YouTube as well as on Twitter. Last thing before we get started, reminder that the webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions, please email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or you can post them in the YouTube channel. Either way, they will be propagated to the speaker at the end of the presentation. Lastly, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Jose Hernandez. Professor Hernandez completed his Bachelor of Chemistry at the Industrial University of Santander in Colombia. In 2013, he obtained his PhD at the Center for Research and Advanced Studies of the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico. After that, Professor Hernandez spent two years as a postdoctoral research at McGill University in Canada. In 2015, he began working as a researcher and lecturer at the RWDH Aachen University in Germany. In 2021, he joined the Radier Bosvik Institute in Zagreb, Croatia as a senior research associate. And most recently, since December 2021, Professor Hernandez has been an associate professor at the University of Antigua in Colombia. Professor Hernandez serves as an associate S editor for the Balstein Journal of Organic Chemistry, and his research interests include the discovery, development, and understanding of mechanochemical reactions biased by the effect of mechanical force. Join me in welcoming Professor Jose Hernandez. Thank you very much for, for the introduction, and thank you especially for having me here. It's a great pleasure for me um, to give a presentation in this uh, series of seminars that the Center for, Chem for Mechanical Control of Chemistry um, uh, is organizing. For today's presentation, I have decided to focus and to speak about the, 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 the link or connection that, uh, between polymer and small molecule mechanochemistry. And today I am uh, coming to you from Colombia, uh, from some of you who don't know where Colombia is located. Um, so Colombia is uh, in the northern part uh, in South America, and the country is divided in different um, departments or states, as they are sometimes called. Um, and one of those is called uh, Antioquia, which is right here, and this is where the university is located. This is where the University of Antioquia uh, has been founded and, and it's been around for over 220 years almost. And there is plenty of research going on. We have some facilities where we do research in, in chemistry, biology, medicine, and this cluster of buildings right here is where the magic happens. And the building here that I'm highlighting, this is where the research group called Cienmate is located. So Cienmate is a a research group that focuses on material science. CIENMATE stands for uh, Ciencia de los Materiales. Um, and this is a group that has been regarded as one of the best uh, research group on the topic of material science in Colombia. And uh, I came back to Colombia last year and I um, joined the group trying to strengthen the beautiful research that they are doing here together with uh, Karen Ardila, who is right here, another person who does mechanochemistry. And basically, Cinemate focuses on um, synthesis and studying uh, biodegradable polymers, bioinorganic chemistry, renewable energies. And we decided to strengthen and complement what Cinemate does by bringing our expertise on, on mechanochemistry. So I've been working on that topic for a while. Um, and actually, my research agenda uh, revolves around mechanochemistry and specifically the use of mechanochemistry for chemical synthesis, for making 
synthesis uh, greener, more sustainable. Um, I have been working on different areas re uh, related to mechanochemistry. And out of that work, well, there are a uh, series of publications where the results have been communicated. Um, for today's presentation, I decided to focus on a, a recent perspective article that I wrote for the Beistein Journal of Organic Chemistry. Um, it was a perspective in which I wanted to um, review and, and highlight some works which seems to show and to uh, demonstrate certain connection or link between polymer and small molecule mechanochemistry. For example, how the techniques that I use mostly for polymer mechanochemistry could be used for a small molecule mechanochemistry and vice versa. But if somebody in the audience still doesn't know what mechanochemistry is, well, mechanochemistry is an umbrella term that encompasses those physical chemical changes which are um, triggered, sustained, facilitated uh, by mechanical energy, mechanical force. And if you intend to carry out a mechanochemical reaction, well, there are different strategies that you could use. You can perhaps use compression to cause changes in your system, tension, uh, shear forces, or impact. Those are the ways you could uh, introduce mechanical deformation to transduce mechanical force into a system. Historically, when you go back uh, and start looking what people did in the past, well, you might find that uh, to create new chemicals, people were combining them, starting materials in a mortar and a puzzle, for example, and trying to use manual grinding in order to mix them together, to activate them and, and to uh, force them to react. And this is how people did it in the past. Nowadays, you can find a mortar and a pestle anywhere. So you could do mechanochemistry right away. But in order to achieve higher reproducibility, for example, and also for safety issues, some people have shifted into the use of electrical ball mills. So in a lab scale, for example, you might uh, find um, mixer mills, also called vibratory mills, or planetary ball mills, in which what you have is a container. And that container can be charged with the chemicals and also balls. Um, and the container will be then either uh, shaken or rotated at different speeds. And that enables you many things. For example, mixing. If you bring together the chemicals, then there is a chance for them to react. Uh, also, you can promote, for example, um, defects, uh, transient or permanent defects into materials. You can promote uh, polymorphic transformations. You can achieve um, uh, reactions which, which sometimes are inaccessible by any other means. Um, but there are different techniques. Not only ball milling uh, could be used for carrying out mechanochemical reactions. There are other techniques. And later today, we will, be, we will see the importance of a technique called uh, disc mill milling or ring and pack milling. So here there are no balls. What you have basically is a, is a container. And within the container, you have some rings and, and a pack or a disc, which will rotate. And there are few or none collisions, what you have is mostly compression, compression forces and tensile forces which are applied to the sample. And that enables you to uh, carry out chemical reactions as well. Most of those techniques have been used in the field of small molecule mechanochemistry to make new chemicals. Of course, you can also put within one of those containers a polymer, and you can uh, promote uh, bond cleavage within a polymer, or you can synthesize polymers by bone milling. But when you speak about polymer mechanochemistry, well, it's a little bit different. So what you have here is a polymer, uh, which um, contains some units which tend to react with mechanical force is applied. Those units are called mechanophores. So you have mechanophores which are planted or embedded along the polymer backbone. And when force is applied, those mechanophores tend to react. When I say react, sometimes they break. Sometimes there is a um, homolytic bone cleavage, or sometimes they just rearrange. If they break, well, the polymer will break into pieces. But some polymers could have multiple mechanophores. How do you apply or transduce mechanical force in those cases? 
people have used, for example, a technique called pulse ultrasonication, in which the cavitation that is promoted in a liquid medium would um, pull, let's say, pull the polymer apart. And when that happens, there is a point in which the force, it is enough to uh, activate the mechanophore, which is within the polymer, and then you see a chemical reaction, which is promoted mechanically. Um, there are other techniques, for example, atomic force microsco microscopy. In this case, you can do the analysis on a single molecule, and you can get data such as what is the force needed to cleavage or to break that specific bond. But also you can get kinetic data out of, out of those experiments, and they complement each other. There are also other techniques such as uh, optical tweezers or magnetic tweezers, which enable you to, to get data out of that. But what is important here to highlight is that it seems like by pulse ultrasonication and atomic form microscopy, and by using the polymers, you can achieve something which is very important, directionality. Remember that force is a vector, and it's very important the direction through which you apply the force within that material. And this is something that perhaps people consider that ball milling is lacking. So we don't have the way to control very well the directionality. If, if you want to get more information, especially principle and application of covalent polymer, uh, covalent polymer mechanochemistry, I recommend you to go and check out a previous seminar um, here uh, within the, the series of seminars that the uh, CMCC has. Um, when Professor Cray was giving an excellent lecture on the application and the ability of mechanical force to activate systems. And I'm talking about the CMCC and the, the importance of this talk, I consider because when you go and you check the website, and I think many of you have done, you will see some of those beautiful pictures where it is clear that the intention of the center is to go all the way to understand what happens at the atomic scale, at the nano scale, and at the macro scale. For example, when you consider the collision of a ball uh, within one of those milling containers, well, there is, a, a, there is a need for understanding what happens exactly when the collision occurs, what happens at the interface when two balls collide, how is the mixing occurring between those solids, and most importantly, is it possible that the, the vector force is causing a change in the activation barrier and, and that we can bias really a chemical reaction mechanochemically? And this is what the center has called the grand challenge. And I agree, it's a grand challenge. So what I want to do here is to try to show you that uh, perhaps those fields, polymer and small molecule mechanochemistry seems to be more related than we think. So for years, I've been reading literature on the topic of mechanochemistry, and I've noticed that it seems like there are two areas, there are two sides. You have the community working on polymer mechanochemistry, um, who, as I said, uh, uses most of the time pulse ultrasonication or atomic force microscopy. And there is the community which makes molecules um, in the field of small molecule mechanochemistry and make use of grinding, ball milling to activate the system. Um, however, uh, there is always a discussion. Are, are they completely different? Are there similarities? How different are they? Um, and this is a question that not is not discussed so much at scientific papers, for example. But when you're at events, a scientific event, well, the question is, is always asked. And, and, and there is always discussion, positive and constructive discussion. The last time I heard that um, uh, discussion going on was early this year in an online seminar that was organized by uh, a scientific journal where people were discussing the, 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 the applicability of mechanochemistry. And after two hours and 20 minutes, uh, somebody in the audience asked the question, what is the connection between polymer and a small molecule mechanochemistry? So the host that day was Professor Moores, and, and he rephrased the question a few times. Um, what was the connection? What was the correlation? How can polymer mechanochemistry uh, activate a small molecule mechanochemistry system? Um, and there were some answers given then at that moment. And I think that was one of the, the, the motivations for me to write that perspective, because from my point of view, there were some connections. There were some cases in which sometimes without um, like unconsciously, some colleagues have observed uh, results which 
demonstrated that they were somehow connected. The main uh, difference that people sometimes talk about is the directionality that I mentioned before, that by pulse ultrasonication, you can really control the direction through which the force is applied. Whereas by ball milling, what you have, well, is not something like this. You don't have a very predictable way how the balls collide to each other. This is not how it's happening. It looks mostly like this. So you have a, a more random set of, of collisions, and if you happen to be inside that container, well, you will, you will be exposed to a large number of, of collisions that would cause, as I said before, uh, amorphization sometimes uh, within your structure, or, or you could undergo polymorphic transformation, but for sure you will be mixed very well within that container. Uh, so the question is, would it be possible, is it possible actually to achieve some directionality? Can, for example, uh, mechanophores within Polymers be activated also by ball milling and not only by sonication, for example. Um, well, looking in the literature, searching there, I found that there were some examples. Um, let's consider this polymer, polymer number one, which was uh, uh, synthesized, and this is a polymer that contains a mechanophore. This is the mechanophore. It's an anthracene endoperoxide mechanophore, um, which can be activated by mechanical force, for example, by sonication. But what the authors did, well, they did a milling process. They took the polymer and they like ground it for a while. What they observed was indeed the release of um, oxygen, singlet oxygen, and also the transformation of the polymer, the original polymer, into the anthracene containing polymer. So the question here was, is it really this reaction promoted mechanically? And for addressing that question, the authors uh, carry out reactions at low temperature, at cryo temperatures. And they demonstrated that even at such low temperature, the polymer was undergoing the mechanochemical reaction by milling. Also, they demonstrated that polymer number one was stable at high temperatures. They demonstrated in that way that indeed, uh, by milling, you could activate the mechanophore within that polymer. In other words, that you could use the force that you generate, that you can harvest that, that uh, and leverage that force and, and use it throughout the polymer. And the polymer was working as a medium to transduce that mechanical force. Is it the one and the only example out there? Well, I found another example published last year in which uh, once again, there was a polymer that contained a, me a mechanophore. Here we are looking at the mechanophore, which is actually a, a peroxide. Um, peroxides tend to, uh, are prone to undergo um, cleavage by homolytic uh, bone cleavage, which generate radicals. When that polymer was subjected to ball milling, well, the reaction promoted the release of a stable fluorescent uh, neutral molecule that was detected. Meaning that by ball milling also, and once again, the force could be transduced all the way to the mechanophore within the polymer. Important here, the authors demonstrated the importance of, of the polymer because when they try to activate the, uh, let's say, uh, model compound, the monomer, the dial, which lacks the polymer, the uh, efficiency was really, really poor, meaning that you really need the polymer to, uh, to use that mechanical force that you achieve by ball milling in order to activate the mechanophore. Also, um, the polymer and also the mechanophore, the, the, the monomer, it's uh, stable uh, at high temperature, meaning that the reaction was mostly mechanochemically driven and not thermally driven. So here we have examples in which a technique for milling, which is often used for small molecule mechanochemistry, can also be applied for the activation of mechanophores in polymer mechanochemistry. Are there comparative studies? Well, last year there was another study that was uh, reported in which the authors uh, synthesized uh, bottle brush polymers and also dendronized polymer base, such as the one I'm showing here. That polymer also contained a mechanophore right here. And they tried to see what was the consequence of sonicating this polymer or the consequence of putting that polymer within a container, a millimeter for a while. They observe that if you sonicate uh, this polymer, what you observe most of the time, and exclusively practically, was the backbone cleavage. 
you don't see really activation of the arms that contain the mechanophore. Whereas when the reaction was carried out by Volmilin, um, then here you see also the cleavage of the backbone. But in this case, you can see the activation of the mechanophore, meaning that you can do the same by both techniques. But also, Volmilin could bring you something else. So they are more, they, are, they complement each other. And this is quite quite important. And the reasons why uh, they are working differently, well, they were uh, related to the difference in which the activation occurs in solid state because the ball milling experiment was done in solid state, whereas the sonication part is done in solution. So the differences in which and how the force is transduced and the uh, lower mobility that you would have in solid state might have directed the reaction towards the activation of both, the cleavage of the backbone and also the arms. Until now, I've shown you uh, polymers, which are activated by ball milling, and those are man-made polymers. However, nature also makes polymers. For example, cellulose, ketene, lignin are biomacromolecules, or let's call it biopolymers, that are of interest nowadays. Many groups are looking into how to depolymerize cellulose or ketene or lignin, trying to access, for example, uh, sugars or aromatics. And in order to do that, they have been looking into ball milling techniques. Why? Because, well, the solubility of these substrates is quite poor. And ball milling enables you to carry out reactions without solvents, for example. So this is not a concern that you need to have. So you just try to grind them in certain conditions. But sometimes when those studies were carried out, they observed not only that the reaction could proceed mechanochemically, but the reaction was much better than the reaction in solution. In some cases, different selectivity was observed. And this is one of the cases. Previous reports on the depolymerization of ketene had demonstrated that in solution, what happened is that, well, you would have, for example, two reactions operating. One is the uh, Mi bond cleavage or the deacetylation from ketene to generate glucosamine, but also you will promote in, in solution the cleavage of those glycosidic bonds. So you have depolymerization, but also deacetylation. When people try to do this reaction kind of chemically, so they put in the ball mill, they observe a different type of selectivity in the reaction. There was only cleavage of the backbone of ketene. So there was no deacetylation. So somehow the mechanical activation that is, is, is happening during the ball milling procedure is uh, favoring the reaction and is uh, achieving higher selectivity towards the glycosidic bone cleavage over the MI bone breakage. And the question is why? So there were some computational studies that were carried out trying to um, understand what was going on. How was the force uh, promoting that change in selectivity? If you go and look into what they found was that if you have a model compound that simulates a ketene and you apply tensile forces, well, those tensile forces um, promote changes um, in the conformation of that polymer and also facilitate the cleavage of the glycosidic bonds. So the tensile force really plays a role in facilitating the reaction that cleavage the, the backbone of the polymer. But because directionality was not applied or is not so effectively applied through the uh, MI bond, so the acetylation was not promoted so easily. So meaning that somehow, apparently, uh, by ball milling, you can induce tensile forces, which can then bias a reaction mechanochemically. If you consider a ball collision, and this is what uh, some uh, people did, well, when you have a, a ball colliding again against another ball and sample happens to be in between, or a ball collides against the um, inside wa wall of a milling container, well, you will have uh, compressive forces. But also there is a portion of tensile forces that appear by ball milling. And Precisely, they demonstrated that those tensile forces, despite being at the sub nano Newton scale, they can add up and facilitate the cleavage of the um, of the ketene. Um, 
this is important because when you do ball milling, especially by, by using mixer mills that we saw at the beginning, we consider most of the time the, the strength of the collision, the compressive forces, and sometimes the shearing forces or those tensile forces are overlooked. However, they demonstrated that it is possible to also achieve tensile forces, which can bias chemical reactions and facilitate the cleavage of certain bonds. And the authors, after um, experimental studies and also computational studies, well, they concluded something like, uh, if um, a mechanochemical or mechanical method, and I said different from ball milling, is developed, um, which can apply tensile forces um, selectively, well, that could be, um, in, that could improve how the reaction works. Uh, however, I think that method is already there, it's out there. Uh, as I mentioned before, not only balls can be used to grind down material. So in, in many companies and industry, ring and pack mills are, all, are always there. And, and, and here the difference is, as I said before, there are, not, there are no balls, there are fewer collisions. What you have is mostly a disc and a ring that is moving around, exerting um, mechanical force through compressive and tensile forces. So perhaps a technique like this could activate a material because then you will have fewer collisions, but mostly tensile force. In the past, we were working on, on trying to break down lignin. So we were interested at that moment on depolymerization of lignin, trying to, valor, uh, to uh, work on the valorization of a, bio, a biomass uh, material. And we demonstrated that under certain conditions, it was possible to carry out the cleavage of lignin trying to access aromatics within the structure. The conditions were um, oxidative conditions in which we uh, mixed together hydroxy tempo and, and uh, KBR and oxon for 90 meters within a, a ball mill, um, a mixer mill, let's call it. And the reaction proceeded quite well. We observed oxidation and cleavage, and we determined that after 90 minutes, we achieved 40% decrease in the molecular weight of the lignin. We were working at the milligram scale at that moment, and we wondered whether it would be possible to carry out the reaction at a higher scale, so that to demonstrate that indeed the scale up is, is, is achievable by mechanochemistry. So we decided to do the reaction in the gram scale. I think uh, if I recall correctly, 10 gram scale, and to do that, we use a ring and a pack mill. What we observed was that the reaction proceeded even better. And with only 30 minutes, we managed to achieve higher um, decrease in, in, in uh, molecular weight within the lignin biomacromolecule. And immediately we observed the presence of those uh, aromatic that we were looking for. So somehow um, the, this change in technique was favoring the reaction to proceed much better and in shorter time. So the question here was, could it be that the, the disc was somehow exerting mechanical force and, and that the biopolymer, which is the substrate, is also acting as a, as a medium to transduce the mechanical force? And that was the hypothesis that we threw uh, in, in that paper. That was published in 2018, early that year. And a few months later, we, we saw a paper from some colleagues in the US who also observed independently that indeed there is a simplification, they call it, in the, in the structure of lignin when it is a ground uh, under oxidative conditions. However, the conditions were different. The only thing that was the same was the type of ball mill that they were using, the type of mill, because this is not a ball mill. Remember, it's a ring mill. Um, and they observed that indeed, uh, when you do the reaction, in this type of setup, then the reaction proceeds faster, cleaner, and more selectively. So it seems that there is a technique that could potentially enable the activation of, why not, mechanophores within polymers in grand scales. And what is the reason for that? Well, as I said before, by, by braiding this milk, you, you achieve um, friction in, in, in higher quantities compared to the impact, which is actually known. Whereas when you do uh, grinding by ball milling, 
you have plenty of those collision, energetic collisions, but the friction is minimum. Sometimes there is, sometimes there is shear force, depending on how the ball is, is moving, the trajectory within that container, uh, whereas you have one or two balls. Uh, but most of the time, what you have is impact when you do reaction by in mixer mills. So this could be an, an option to achieve higher directionality by milling techniques, which could be applicable for polymer uh, mechanochemistry. So what we have learned until now, I think um, we have learned that we can activate mechanophores in, in polymers, not only by sonication, but that there is a growing body of evidence that ball milling techniques can also be used for doing that. So that we can harness the mechanical force for milling techniques um, and we can use the, 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 the polymer backbone to transduce mechanical force all the way to a mechanophore, which is uh, planted or, or embedded within a polymer material. Also, we observe that um, sonication and, and ball milling can cause the same effect on a polymeric material, but sometimes they can even complement each other. And that if you want to gain directionality, well, you can find already available techniques which can help you out to increase the directionality, something that it seems to be lacking uh, uh, when you do the reactions by ball mill. When we speak about polymer mechanochemistry, well, and when you read literature on the topic, there is always the, the concept of mechanophores, mechanophores. And originally, they were considered molecular entities. However, uh, nowadays, there are mechanophores which are not purely organic, for example. They are organometallic in nature. Some of them are all even uh, inorganic in nature. Um, Therefore, maybe the definition should be changed a little. So it's not a molecular entity. It's an, it's, a, it's an entity that responds in a selective manner to a mechanical perturbation. And I said inorganic material, which could uh, react or, or, or um, behave differently when mechanical force is applied. Um, there are some materials which are called piezoelectric materials. They are organic, they are polymeric, but they are also inorganic in nature, some of them, and they have a characteristic, they can accumulate electric charge when, are, when they are subjected to mechanical forces, and they can produce electric uh, energy um, upon application of mechanical stress. And when you go into the literature, you will see that um, sonication techniques, which are usually used for polymer mechanochemistry, have been used to activate piezoelectric materials. One of those is barium titanate, which is uh, shown here. If it is activated, well, it will generate certain charges on the surface, and those charges, uh, negative charges, could be used or harvested in order to perform chemical reactions. For instance, if you consider the presence of a, a copper two complex, which is a catalytically inactive in certain reaction, such as an atomic, uh, an atom transfer radical polymerization, well, you could harvest those electrons so that the reduction occurs, and then you end up with a copper one complex, which is active for this reaction. And this is something that was demonstrated by some colleagues um, in the US in 2017, so that you could promote um, a mechanochemical reduction by taking advantage of that activity that piezoelectric material has when mechanical force is applied, so that piezoelectric material were acting somehow as mechanophores for this reaction. But is it only sonication, the only technique that uh, can activate piezoelectric materials in that way? So we studied the reaction by ball milling. So we wanted to see if we could um, use the mechanical deformation that collisions of balls or the ball within the container could cause on barium titanate to create those regions in which you have charges. And we demonstrate that indeed by ball milling, you can also activate the selective material so that a reduction can be promoted. And then you might end up with a catalytically active species for a reaction. In this case, it's not a polymerization reaction. It's an atomic atom transfer radical cyclization reaction. But we were demonstrated by two techniques which are completely different and used in different uh, areas of mechanochemistry could be used to activate a perhaps new type of mechanophores. Um, and the, the, the concept of um, using mechanophores 
and especially piezoelectric materials in mechanochemistry is growing in, in, in popularity. And you want to go and check out pioneering work that was done uh, in, in Japan. So I recommend you to go again and check out another video that is part of this initiative. And as I said before, um, in private, uh, this uh, initiative is coming a, a very nice repository for a lot of knowledge on the on the on the topic of mechanochemistry. So I really invite you to go and check out the concept of mechanophores and and, and how they can be used for mechanochemical reactions in this presentation. So the point I want to make here was that perhaps also there are another alternative different from polymers to transduce mechanical force to mechanophores? Because remember, until now, if you wanted to activate a mechanophore, you needed the mechanophore to be part of a polymer, and then you needed to sonicate that polymer, you needed to pull it apart, or you needed to put it into a ball mill. But do we really need the polymer? Maybe it could be simpler than that. And Two years ago, uh, somebody, a, a group of colleagues, they demonstrated that perhaps porous semi-rigid molecules could also be used to transduce mechanical force to mechanophores. And they demonstrated it this way. So they had uh, molecules that, such as five, which are porous. And when they ground together, uh, capsules like five with uh, fullerene such as uh, C60 or C70, they observed that at the end of the milling process, there was an encapsulation that had occurred. The thing is that the, um, the porous that the capsule has is not that big. It's not big enough for C70 to go inside. So how did the process occur? The thing is that during the collisions, well, the capsule transduce the mechanical force to the sides of the, of the, of the porous molecule. And there you have some uh, places where those, um, those uh, functionalities could be broken apart by mechanical force and they could um, reassemble later after the reaction proceeded. So the encapsulation occurred because ball milling was promoting the cleavage of, um, uh, let me show you here, the cleavage of those bonds which were forming the capsule. So somehow telling you that you might not need all the time to have polymers, that discrete molecules could act as a transducer for mechanical force. So that mechanophores can activate it also by a ball milling and you don't need, for example, either the polymer or the sonication, showing that perhaps there are opportunities to develop the concept further. But do we need to make the capsule? What if you could harness the um, uh, non-covalent interactions for, for transducing mechanical force? And this is another uh, word that I wanted to highlight before finishing, and it is uh, related to the ability of, of um, non-covalent interactions, such as hydrogen bonding, to facilitate the assembling of um, small parts together so that you can create such as uh, something like a polymeric material which is kept together uh, only by, uh, by non-covalent interactions. So here on, on the top, we have a molecule, number six, which is a tetraryl uh, succinonitrile derivative. It is a non-mechanophore, which uh, tends to break apart. You can promote a homolytic cleavage here to generate radicals. And that happens. And if you do it by bombing, that would happen. So you would be able to generate those radicals. However, when the authors compare the reactivity of molecule number six uh, and molecule number eight, they observed that the second one was almost 30 times more active towards the generation of the radicals. So the question is, is it because, well, now those groups here uh, somehow end up stabilizing the radical that is formed? Or is there something else that is going on? Well, they demonstrated that what happened is that when you try to um, grind molecule number eight, it is always uh, trying to self-assembly and generating molecules which are larger in, 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 in volume and, and, and in, in size, and then the transduction of mechanical force is more effective. Whereas when you try to grind 
for example, in a mixer mill, molecule number six, you are um, colliding or trying to activate discrete small molecules. So that somehow you could harvest and, and, and try to um, take advantage of the non-covalent and those so-called weak forces to generate a complex which is much more active for the transduction of mechanical force. And as you see here, so there was no need for making a polymer. There was no need for making a, a, a capsule. So it is trying to uh, harness the, the, the strength of so the weak interaction that you could generate by grinding together uh, substrate. And I think that might be um, something to look into the future, trying to see if non-covalent interactions uh, could enable to simplify it and to bias mechanochemical reactions, either in the field of polymer me mechanochemistry or, sm or small molecule mechanochemistry. Uh, with this, I am uh, coming to, to an end here. So I wanted to conclude some, some uh, thoughts uh, which are re uh, related to the, well, the, the ability of not only ultrasonication to activate mechanophores which are within polymers, but uh, a growing body of evidence it is demonstrating that also bot milling is competent uh, enough to activate and to trigger mechanochemical reaction within polymeric material and to activate mechanophores. And that the polymer backbone can also transduce the mechanical cues from bot milling all the way to the mechanophore, which is embedded within. And also um, that if a technique or if we develop techniques that enable us to control directionality and, and, and the way the mechanical or the mechanical force and, and the vector force is introduced into a mechanical system, we will gain uh, the ability to bias a reaction mechanochemically more efficiently. And I show you that in the market, there are some techniques already there, which could enable you to, for example, uh, introduce tensile forces with higher directionality uh, and predominantly over, for example, compressive forces. And that even though uh, polymers are extremely useful to transduce mechanical force and they have been fundamental to developing the, the, the field, well, there are studies that are showing that, uh, for example, porous molecules could be used also to transduce mechanical force and they might be somehow advantageous in certain cases why? Because they are discrete molecules. In some cases, polymer will be more advantageous. In some cases, it would be better and to have molecules which are smaller than you can um, modify easier to transduce mechanical force. And don't forget the possibility to also make use of uh, non-covalent interactions to create um, supramolecular assemblies, which can also be activated mechanochemically. So this is what I wanted to, um, to convey today, the idea that uh, even though polymer and small molecule mechanochemistry uh, at certain moments seems to be a different world, actually they share uh, similarities, they complement each other, and that they are moving forward together. And if they do so, well, they will strengthen the field as a whole in the future. So with this, I want to conclude. Thank you very much once again for having me uh, here. It was a pleasure for me to, to participate in this series of, of seminars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. First, uh, in the ring on puck mill, it seems likely that shear force is a major factor. Do you think shear and tensile force are are activating the reaction using in the same through the same mechanism? Um, well, yes. So let's try to go. Oh, maybe here. This is where we can see. So. Actually, in this case, it is true. So there are non uh, collisions. So the this is just rotating around, and there is a lot of compression. Um, but also, when that compression occurs, um, there is also tensile force that is happening, and perhaps much better than uh, when a ball collides, like I showed here. And therefore, uh, the shear force and also the um, the tension or the tensile force that is created can bias a, a reaction. And those are the main mechanisms through which a uh, reaction is proceeding with that technique. So that is an, an alternative to uh, take advantage of two different uh, forces, the tensile forces, for example, and the shear forces, and try to minimize 
the compressive force. It could also help understand certain mechanisms where uh, you could perhaps uh, split and try to understand whether it is the compressive force or the tensile force, the one that is being more uh, important for a reaction to occur. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next question. The use of piezoelectric materials is very cool. <laughs> Do you think that in addition to the mechanical force causing electricity, these effects could couple to drive the reaction? Um, absolutely. Um, I, I, I like a lot the concept of piezoelectric materials because I feel like it was a way to really demonstrate the, the concept of mechanophore uh, by Paul Millen, because you have a material which is susceptible to um, uh, accumulate electrical charge only when the collisions occur. So that in this case, indeed, you are using mechanical force for doing chemical transformation. You are uh, transforming the mechanical force into a chemical uh, force for the reaction to proceed. Um, and in doing so, uh, you can, really do kind of a electromechanochemical reaction. But one way to put it is also to consider as a way to do photomechanochemical reaction without the need for the light. Because in this case, the electrons are being harvested from the piezoelectric material. So it's a, it's a concept that actually expands through different uh, fields. So it touches a little bit of electromechanochemistry, let's say, and also uh, photochemical, mechanochemical reactions. But what I like a lot of this concept is the fact that um, you can really harvest uh, through mechanical force electrons and using them as, as, as reagents for, for carrying out, for example, reduction reaction. And there are more examples, and that's why I suggested you to go and, and, and check out other uh, cases in which uh, piezoelectric material has been used for biasing reactions in organic chemistry. All right, thank you. Next question. Do you think the mechanical modification of polymers can be done in extruders? Is there any level of selectivity here? Well, one of the things with extrusion is that um, it is great for reactions that are um, uh, mixing stoichiometrically stoichiometric amounts of reagent let's say a and b you put them together and then you will promote a condensation reaction for example um, when it comes to catalytic reaction it is a little bit more difficult so that if that um, modification that it was mentioned requires a catalyst for for the reaction to proceed it will be a little bit more difficult because then the the dispersion of that catalyst within that substrate that wants to be um, activated makes the, the, the reaction even more challenging. Let's say that um, it is not that obvious how to do it. We have reported two times a catalytic reaction which have been done um, uh, by extrusion, but indeed uh, extrusion, for example, have the possibility to exert shearing forces um, which are important to, for example, pull and, and exert tensile forces within that polymer. So that I see potential, but of course there is also to have to we have to be cautious um, to say yes, it is possible, but it is it's an opportunity, and for sure, if somebody undertakes the, this challenge, we find surprises, but also rewards. Uh, and I would I would suggest uh, to look into yeah, to, looking into uh, extrusion to activate and modify polymers uh, mechanochemically, yeah. All right, great. Let's do one more question. The supermolecular aspect is quite intriguing. Do you think that these types of molecular interactions are what's at play in lag? And this presents a new way in which reactions can be can be controlled. Absolutely. Um, there are not so many cases in which we have seen that supramolecular interactions uh, are directing or, or templating reaction, but there are cases. There are a few cases in which we have observed those interactions taking place. In, in neat grinding, meaning without any solvent, or in liquid assisted grinding, meaning lack reactions. And of course, if you have a, a small amount of solvent, well, that solvent might help you bring in together or bridging those two chemicals, um, how? Maybe through non-covalent interactions. So, I know that some people have looked into uh, the dipoles that um, solvents have to see the connection between the reactivity that they observe and the, um, the type of solvent that they use. 
but also that dipole might also tells you something about the ability of that solvent to participate in non covalent interactions. And I think as organic chemists, which who has to modify chemicals covalently, um, the, the, the possibility to take advantage of non-covalent interactions to carry out reaction is, 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 is wonderful because then by just, for example, dissolving that supramolecular assembly, you might break it apart. So you don't need to cleavage a covalent bond, you just need to dissolve your product or your intermediates. So I think the future is going towards that direction, trying to take advantage of non-covalent interaction, which in solution might be very weak, but by mechanochemistry, in the absence of solvents, they, despite being weak, are the only one operational during the reaction. So they become stronger because there is no, com uh, there are no competitors. There is no solvation, for example. So I think uh, it's true. In the future, we will see more reactions which are um, templated or governed or biased through uh, non-covalent interactions. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks again for participating in the mechanochemistry discussions. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Hernandez, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. Again, if you've missed any of our previous seminars as part of the mechanochemistry discussions, please check them all out on the YouTube channel. We also encourage you to join us in the upcoming month, months for future seminars, for which we have a great slate of speakers lined up. Thank you again. <laughs>